This is One on One. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato, coming to you from the WNET TIS studios. It is my honor, my pleasure to introduce a gentleman you're about to see on camera. I think you recognize him. He is uh, former United States Senator Bill Bradley. He ran for president in the year 2000. He is a former New York Knicks. He won two, two. NBA championships. Two. He played uh, for the United States Olympic basketball team, I believe, in 1964. Back in the Paleolithic era. <laughs> and you guys won. Yeah, we did. You won. Um, that was a dream team? No, that was not the dream <laughs> team. That was before the dream team. How you doing? I'm great. Great, Steve. You enjoy your life uh, outside of elective office? I do. I have a very full life. Uh, I work at Allen & Company, which is a small merchant bank. I have a radio show on Sirius XM called American Voices. People ask me, what do I miss about not being in politics? I really miss two things. One, I miss public policy, not doing it 24 hours a day. Mm. I fill that void with right, by writing books like this one. We're about to plug it in yeah, a second. whatever. And uh, I also miss the people and all their shapes and all their hopes and dreams. And I plug into people with my show on Sirius XM called American Voices. Yeah, Senator Bradley was famous for a lot of things when he was in the Senate. But one thing, for those of us who were born and raised in New Jersey, he used to do a, a walking tour at the Jersey Shore that, uh, I mean, it became a wild scene. You would just attract all sorts yeah. of people. And you loved that, didn't you? I loved it. I loved it. Actually, I missed that. And uh, I missed the people, that's what I say. Yeah. Yeah. We but started at Cape May and ended up at Sandy Hook. It was a week of walking. You didn't walk every foot of the beach, but you walked in every town, every town. Mm. And uh, it was a way of being accessible. And I'd always learned so much in the course of that because people say the oddest things to you, and a lot of times it's insightful. I have a sense that Senator Bradley heard a lot of those odd and insightful things that were said. And I believe that uh, obviously he thinks that uh, those folks and all of us can do better. And uh, we in the media can better, do better, and hopefully uh, folks in government can do better, which is why he wrote this book, We Can All Do Better. Bill Bradley, New York Times bestselling author. Senator, as I was uh, getting ready for the show and, and reading sections of the book, all of us can do better, right? Yeah, that's, that's the can, point. Can we start with the people first? Because yeah, sure. you're not a huge fan of some of the folks who have organized to try to do better, or at least say to do better, whether it's the Tea Party folks or even the Occupy folks. You're not super negative toward them, but that isn't necessarily what you mean by the people, is you it? You might say I'm super negative toward the Tea Party. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And by, but by anyway, the way, that's another, that's another that isn't story. what you mean by doing yeah. better, is it? You know, you look at the problems in Washington, obviously Washington can do better. Uh, look at the problems in the world, we can do better. But by saying this, I was saying what Lincoln said in uh, the Civil War. The country's been at war for about a year. The North's not doing well. He gives a second State of the Union message, and he says, you know, it's not can any of us imagine better, but can we all do better? And when that comes to a personal level, you know, you take care of your body. You, know, you take care of your body, you cost the health care system more. Mm. If you're a student, you actually spend time learning which put you in good shape for the next 30 or 40 years. So we can all do better, and we have to reach into ourselves and find that part that allows us to give our maximum effort and know at the end of the day that we've done our best. It's interesting as you say this. I had a conversation with Governor Christie. Mm -hmm. um, um, actually, I was telling him that you were coming in the studio, and, uh, and he was at a town meeting in Patterson, New Jersey, um, in a church, Baptist church, and they were talking about urban schools. A guy got up and yelled, fix our public schools. You, governor, fix our public schools. And it just struck me in the context of this conversation because Governor Christie went back and forth with him in that audience. Right. You, governor, fix our schools. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's just interesting in the context of this conversation. Do you get the well, I think, paradox uh, there? Yeah, I do. I think a governor has got to provide leadership, like a senator, right? But ultimately, schools are a function of families, a function of parents, a function of teachers. And it's not something that you fix, like, you know, you fix your bicycle, right? Fix it. it. Yeah. It's something that belongs to all of us. And unless we all take responsibility for it, it's not going to be as good as it can be. And Senator, when you say that to people, when you engage people on your serious program, are you still out there speaking all the time? And you say to people, well, hold on, wait a minute. You want me, when yeah. you're a U.S. They, Senator of the government, you say, look, hold on, you have skin in this right, game. Right, right. Can they handle the truth? I think that the people can handle the truth. The point is they rarely get the full truth. And few people ask them to sacrifice and ask them to do for all of us what each of us has to do in order to have a better place. 
Um, speaking of the truth, let's talk about the truth on tax policy. What do we need to do better on tax policy? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, there's, the president says he wants tax reform. I think that if you get tax reform, you've got to have a president who's committed, secretary of state who can cut a deal, and you need chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee who see their political future served by doing tax reform. And, uh, you know, Republicans don't want to raise taxes. Uh, they don't like high rates. Democrats want to close loopholes. In 86, we lowered rates and closed loopholes. Right now, what I think we ought to do is we ought to say, okay, let's do tax reform, close loopholes immediately. But if per capita income goes up 5%, 10%, we'll cut the top rate. Or growth goes up, then we'll be able to cut the top rate. There you put everybody's interests in one place. And I think that would give Republicans an excuse to support a bill where there will be immediate tax increases because the prospect of having a rate cut exists if all of us do better, if per capita income goes up. I mean, keep in mind, per capita income was the same in 2010 as it was in 1996. So mm -hmm. people of middle class have been stagnant. Well, if, they get an in if their per capita income is up 10 percent, I think that they don't care what happens to people who are wealthy. So is President Obama correct? We do this program as we enter the spring in 2013, um, another fiscal cliff discussion, debate, right? Um, goes on, not doing better there, I know, Senator. Is the president right in your opinion when he says those who are the wealthiest should be paying more? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the principles of tax reform is those who have more should pay more. There's no question about that. Uh, I also think another principle should be equal income should pay equal tax. Somebody Say that again, equal income? Equal income should pay equal tax. A lot of times you and I make the same income, but I have a loophole, so I pay less tax and you don't. I don't think that's fair. And so I think that there's no question that we should have a progressive income tax system. The issue is how do you convey that? Mm. You've got to convey that in a way that says we're all in this together and everybody's got to do their part. Talk to me, uh, talk to our audience. Uh, by the way, United States Senator Bill Bradley is with us. His book is out. Uh, we hope it becomes another bestseller. We can all do better. Um, by the way, you got a, a quote on the front cover by Howard Schultz, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer from my favorite place to get coffee in the morning, Starbucks. Good to hear. Um, talk to us about the role of the media. You said a lot of things in the book about the media doing better or the need for the media to do better. What do we have wrong, most of us? Well, I think, first of all, you're under tremendous pressure of space. You know, you only have a short period of time to say a lot of things about very complicated issues. And I thought, so I think one of the keys is beyond the uh, capacity of, say, you, because you have a certain limited space. I think, that, uh, I think the media could do a better job of educating the American people about what's at stake. I mean, take a look at the number of foreign policy stories 15 years ago and today. If it's not about a war, it's not on. And so yet the world is a very complex place. I mean, here we are with, say, Northeast Asia with the Chinese and Japanese facing off against each other in a very volatile situation that could involve the United States slipping into war with China because of our security treaty with Japan. You don't, you don't, these are not really discussed in a lot of places and so the public is kind of absent. They don't understand and they don't know. But it goes back again, Senator, to my question about what the public can handle or not. And when I say the public, it's not a monolithic entity. There are different segments or sectors of the public. Um, the other thing for those of us in the media, and again, I want to I want to believe that those of us who work primarily on the public television side and our president here, WNET, Neil Shapiro, talks about this a lot, that we try to have a more oh, sustained I mean, I, discussion. I think, I think there's a world of difference between public television and regular television. What do you think it is? I think that you have a charge that you take seriously of serving the public and not simply the advertisers. Uh, or if you're a cable system, you're not playing to your subscribers with the, however is the most extreme position. Um, I think there is a search for the truth if you see a lot of programs, this included, on public television. And by the way, in that spirit, um, you do spend some time on some of the cable shows. Um, you've done some interviews there. For folks who are, I'm not going to say addicted, but draw them, they, they're drawn to 
whether it's MSNBC or Fox News on a regular basis, and the ideology that they believe they have mm. is reinforced on a regular basis by mm. those stations, or whatever you choose to, mm. uh, wherever you choose to go on the radio, but primarily on the television side. Is there a problem with that? Well, there's not a problem. You have a right to go anywhere you want. Sure you but do. It does, does intensify the extremes. And when you put that together with how we draw congressional district lines, most of them are 60-40 districts because they've been, been essentially written by partisan state legislatures. You then have the media inflaming both ends. And I think one of the interesting things about this, Steve, is though, you know, why, why does that happen? And it happens because it's a cable TV operation. And if, say, Fox News didn't do uh, as conservative a job, they might lose subscribers. Or if the cable television system itself says, we're dropping Fox or MSNBC because they're extremes and we want reasoned discussion, the people who are the customers could very well turn off and not subscribe anymore. So there's an economic element to this as well. Before I let you out of here, um, you think much about the global warming discussion? I think about it, certainly in a year where you have uh, Hurricane Sandy, right? And in a year where you see record temperatures and you see uh, drought in many places, yeah, I think it's a serious thing. I mean, it's polar ice cap is melting. I think it's extremely serious. What is, the dis what, what is it that we need to do better on that discussion? Well, we need to take action because every year we don't. And I've long argued for a carbon tax, thinking, you know, that's the the most significant pollution we have. I'd argued to try to have more fuel efficient cars. 70% of the consumption of oil is transportation. And uh, yet, you know, we don't do it because 15 years ago we tried and didn't succeed. Well, you know, if you play basketball and you miss a shot, what do you do? You look forward to the next shot because you think you have a better chance of making it. And so in politics, you get stung and you just don't go back there anymore. Right. And I think that's too bad. Final topic I want to bring up, which is a very important book, a very important theme in your book, We Can All Do Better. Money, the influence, the problems connected with uh, the massive amount of money in the political system. I mean, you ran for president. In the introduction to your book, you say, I served in the United States Senate for, uh, for how many years? 18. And I ran for president for three, you know? And you talk about the role of money, right? Yeah. It's how bad is it? It's extremely bad. I mean, um, in 2009, 2010, for example, the financial industry contributed $318 million to politicians in Washington in those two years. Mm -hmm. And the healthcare industry contributed 145, and the oil industry contributed 75. So it shouldn't be any wonder that we got watered down financial reform, no public option in healthcare, and didn't even get around to doing an energy bill, even though we're sending billions of dollars to autocrats on the other side of the world. No coincidence. Well, I, I think, <laughs> I, I'm glad you're, you're saying that with tongue in cheek. I think there is a connection. And of course, this is all courtesy of the Supreme Court, <clears throat> because the Supreme Court and Buckley Vallejo and then Citizens United made the argument that you can't limit money because you, you limit money, you're limiting speech. Money equals speech. Money equals speech. And then Citizens United said that, you know, corporations are people. That's what the law has said since the 19th century. And since you can't limit uh, people's right to speech, you can't limit a corporation. It's what was born with the super PACs, where now you just have a, a wave of money coming into the system. And I, I believe that, you know, lobbyists serve a function, but you ought to break the connection between lobbying and money. And that's why, ultimately, I think we need a constitutional amendment that goes beyond the Supreme Court and says, you know, that state, local, federal, state, and local governments may limit the amount of money spent in a political campaign. And then I would prefer public financing at that stage. Senator, I want to thank you for honoring us with your presence here at our studio and uh, encourage everyone to go out and, and get the book. We can all do better by Senator Bill Bradley, but more importantly, uh, go out there and, and try to do better. Senator, I want to thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate Love the show. It. Stay right there. I'm Steve Adubato. This is the WNET Tisch studio, and uh, we had Senator Bill Bradley here. That's why you should watch. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.
Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, TSENG, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Roche, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by New Jersey State Nurses Association.